do it. Pick three. Joining us now in Studio B is the man that we just mentioned behind the mic, star of He's Greg Rebel. Right and he is behind the mic. And once right again, now. that's where I'm setting up. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go out of the shoots with uh, Spencer next Wednesday. So, so, so the plan will be. Big time. Yeah, the plan will be uh, to kick off each show. That first segment will kind of be uh, what's, what's happening now uh, in BYU sports. And I'm going to bring on somebody from BYU TV sports, hopefully every week, to kind of kick it around. And Spencer's first up uh, next week. Then we'll launch into a couple of kind of longer feature-length interviews. Every week you're going to get uh, a current Cougar, uh, a current administrator, player, coach, someone making news currently on campus, for kind of a longer, kind of up-close and personal feature interview. Then we're going to, then we're going to be uh, calling it a Catching Up with the Cougars in the next segment. Again, a feature interview with somebody that's a cougar from a days gone by, player or coach. And we'll either have them in studio or on the line and uh, find out what they're doing, catch up with the cougars, as it were. And then, uh, yeah, that'll be our show. What year of football broadcasting participation is this for you? 26? 26. 26. Yeah. yeah. So this is, we, we joked, this is sort of Christmas. Like, BYU ba- football's back, sort of. They report today. What, what's this like emotionally as we sit here in July, <laughs> but BYU football is doing stuff today? Well, you know, we, we say that the off seasons this year the off season got shorter because they began camp earlier. But it's a it, it's a it's a fact. It's a fact of time and space that the older you get, uh, periods of time shrink to you. Uh, and, and so you cosmic on us. I right am now? because because you know so you know when when you're 50 years old, okay, um, a a a one year span of time is 2% of your life. We've talked about this at lunch. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. If you're 10 years old, a one-year span of time is 10% of your life. So it takes longer in your brain to, you know, to live 10%. But so the older you get, things just tend to really click on by. So the off-seasons do get shorter and shorter as you get older. But this year, they really are shorter because we're starting here in late July. But it's all good. Yeah. Since you brought that to light at lunch, I'm not kidding. I've shared that ideology <laughs> with like 20 people. <laughs> and like, and I'm why, fascinated why are you, why are you saying this, Spencer? What, <laughs> where uh, where did you learn that? You're like, I this? looked this up. <laughs> I, just something that I randomly thought uh, of. Anyway, <laughs> no, but it does, it does feel that way, and it, it really is that way this year, but it's great. I mean, uh, the earlier the better. Of course, the NCAA uh, uh, mandating no more two-a-days, so that's, uh, you know, that, that, that has to kind of fade into the, in, into the vernacular now. No one, two-a-days don't exist anymore. That's, that, that's a thing of the past. And, uh, and BYU gets allotted a certain number of practice periods. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it'll probably, they may, may not use every single one of them, but that's good, too. They'll, they'll, they'll take a break somewhere. Uh, you know, maybe a camping trip like they did last year and, and give themselves some space and time just to, to chill out a little bit, give their bodies a rest, and, that, and that's good too. It's all about making sure you get to week zero, in this case, uh, healthy. Yes. And, and then ideally into week one, healthy. And if you can, if you can pace camp in such a way that, uh, that, that and coach off a good league, you know, the coaches will have their thumb on the pulse of this thing. If you can pace it in such a way to keep yourselves and your bodies in as good a shape as possible and get the mental reps in where they need to be, then it's all good. Are you invited to the gear handout party? I, I mean, get, after 26 <laughs> years, are you not? Do you not get a pass to no, that? I live it vicariously, like we all do through uh, through Twitter. Now we get to see them put the helmets on and everything else. But uh, yeah, it's a cool deal. They're all showing up, and this is the day they become players for the year. And uh, yeah, I like it. Mo Longy gets his iPad today. I think this is a big day for everybody. They all get their iPads. Yeah, in the, the, new, the yeah, newcomers yeah. like, oh sweet, with all the plays and everything. Wait, which that technology is pretty cool. It's it's different than when. Uh, you know, in the 80s where it's like by hand or or when you, or when copied, you had right? to come into the facility to watch film. Uh, now you take film with you and film is video clips and files. And it really is accessible to you whenever, wherever you need it on the plane, on the dry, on the flight home. They're watching film if they choose to. So what they've got, Errol Sieber and his crew and, of course, the entire staff, uh, they give all the players every uh, possibility of success due to technology, and that'll start this morning, too. Yeah. I want to see what other apps are downloaded on each guy's iPad. Like, how much are you using this for non-football stuff? <laughs> That's what I want to Angry know. Birds. <laughs> yeah, Angry Birds or whatever. Um, Netflix all the time. Uh, we're talking about storylines going into fall camp. We've ID'd a couple of them. Tanner Mangum's progression. Who are the offensive playmakers? Kai Nakua. What's, what are some questions you have going into fall camp that you're, you're hoping to start to see answers? Because we don't really get answers until the games. We kind of start to get some answers. If the defense isn't entirely locked down, it's pretty close. Uh, we're trying to find a safety. Uh, we're we're maybe, maybe looking to see of that large group of defensive linemen uh, who, who emerges to be part of a, a, maybe a two-deep rotation. So, but I think most of the questions come on the offensive side. And so to me, the, the main storyline would be, besides quarterback and offensive line, the spine of the offense – how do the other skill positions shake out? Who emerges at running back, tight end, wide receiver? 
And wide receiver is probably a little more loaded than we maybe give it credit for being. But because Micah and Achille were redshirting last year, they were kind of out of sight, out of mind. So who emerges at those three spots around the quarterback and O-line, I think will be, to me, one of the more intriguing storylines. We know who we expect to do well. We expect to see Matt Bushman catch a lot of balls and kind of and kind of uh, put himself near the top of that list along with Moroni Lupututau, but Tanner Baldry was a contributor last year. Don't forget about him. And we expect Squally Canada to get the most looks at the most reps. How will he respond to that? There are a lot of things we expect. We expect Jonah Trinneman to be the lead guy because he has the most receptions coming back, but there are always those those players that jump up and make a name for themselves, and I'm, expe- I'm especially and particularly intrigued at those three spots as to who emerges here in camp. Statistically speaking, what kind of production would be considered the next step or, I don't know, successful for a guy like Tanner Mangum in his current situation? Well, I mean, he set the bar at 3,000-plus as a freshman, right? Um, so he's, he started off pretty well. Uh, you know, 4,000 passing yards is, is a number that you don't see too often. And, and so to, to, to say that's the number you're, you're setting as a standard, you know, that, that's pretty ambitious. Um, but, you know, that, that, I, that's kind of when you're putting yourself in elite BYU quarterback territory when did you're putting you up those. Elite? I did. Okay, just checking. Yeah, it's, it's a good use it's, of that. It's great. a word that we don't use. Small, in vain small on this e, program. small e in this case. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I, I think you know that that would be, of course, a tremendous big time aerial season. Yeah. And uh, and I think you know because you're going to be sacrificing a certain number of ground yards from last year just because of the fact that Tanner and Jamal aren't there. The, where are you going to make them up? And the answer would be most likely through the air with a gunslinger like Tanner Mangum. Okay. 230 a game is 3,000. 307 a game, regular season, is 4,000. Yeah. 300 at BYU doesn't feel like a lot, but I think in the Back in the day, it was, it was, it was, the rigueur is what you expected. Yeah. I think 307 a game passing in this offense might be pushing it a little bit. If you can rush for 200, pass for 200, and you've chronicled this for a long time, those are winning numbers for BYU. So 300 isn't necessarily the benchmark I'm looking at. I'm looking at more like. 250 a game for Tanner Mangum would be good. Yeah, if you were a 300 150 team, uh, pass rush. Oh, you're going to win a lot of games. You're in great shape. Yeah. Uh, and again, 4,000 is an ambitious number, but I don't think anyone's saying that Tanner Mangum couldn't put that up. I mean, he's clearly going to have, he's, he's got that kind of talent in him. And I think, I think the balls will be in the air this year. So, uh, you know, I, I, again, it's, it's, it's a number. But, and I don't want to say that would be the success or not a success. Ultimately, the success is how many W's did you put up, however you got them. Uh, low scoring, high scoring, more rushing, more passing. It doesn't really matter. And BYU won nine games with, what was it, 15 touchdown passes last year? Not a lot, Because yeah. Jamal yeah. Williams was so good. It just, it's a year-to-year thing. Again, the yards and the points from year to year may come in different ways, and I think we'd expect that this year. Just, just, just with the shift of, uh, of talent from two of the most prolific ground gainers. Again, you're looking at the number one of the number five guy in rushing history leaving your team. Two of the top five who've ever run the ball at BYU were on last year's team and aren't on this year's group. So <laughs> That's pretty wild. You're probably giving up some rushing yards uh, in, in, in sacrifice and sacrifice, in balance for some passing yards, and I think Tanner's the guy to get them done. When yeah. you talk about guys like Akile Davis and Micah Simon and Talon Shumway, these guys that – have been off the radar for a while as wide receivers. Which of those guys kind of do you feel like could could step up and play a huge role in this offense? Uh, I'm going to lean to Micah right now. Yeah. Uh, he, he'd be kind of the guy that I'd, I'd put early tabs on. Yeah. Defensively, we feel like we know what's going to happen. Like you said, it's if it's not locked up, it's pretty close. That They turned the ball over so much. It was fantastic. Forced 30, turnovers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Takeaways. Yeah. 31 yeah. takeaways tied with Utah uh, for the second most in the country. Do you think this – they, they can equal to or best that this year? Do you feel like, hey, they returned so many guys that you expect that kind of production similarly again? Yeah, production and disruption. Uh, I think they can be as disruptive as they were last year. And a lot of turnovers is bounce of the ball. Um, it's an oblong or it's a, it, it's a prolate spheroid if you want to be, uh, if you wanna be specific <laughs> wow. about it. But so cosmic and that. Yeah, uh, and, and, you know, oft times, uh, you know, a, a forced fumble doesn't become a recovered fumble because of the way the ball bounces. But they were really good at disruption last year, again, taking teams off schedule. And the same coordinator's back, and a lot of his guys are back, and they're a year better and older and more experienced. And so uh, I I don't think they're going to suddenly become some passive wait-to-see-what-happens group. Uh, They they forced the action last year, and I think they've got got, got the guys to do it again. And one guy that forced the action was Kainakua. who, who do you see as potential guys that could replace Kainakua? Well, you know, there, there's the top three, right? There, there's the Matt Hadley, Zane Anderson, Tanner Jacobson triumvirate right now, and they think somebody will emerge from that group. If it's somebody other than that, that's a heck of a player because those three, those three guys have snaps and reps and experience. And so I guess right now you say that's someone emerges from that trio. And, uh, and, and Matt Hadley, he's interesting because he was a prolific 
offensive player in high school. I mean, prolific. And, and so Kainakua, you know, in high school was, was a quarterback. He was an offensive player too. So Kainakua took kind of an offensive playmaker mindset to the defense. I think Matt Hadley could do very much the same thing, take the offensive playmaker mindset to the I, – I won't be surprised if Matt Hadley has a good camp and really makes a strong run at that spot. Um, not to downplay what Tanner and Zane are able to do, and they're right in the mix. But I just like the way that Matt Hadley's so versatile. I hope he gets used in the, in, in the return game too because I think he's, he's skillful there. He didn't, he didn't quite get – I mean, the, the running back core is deep enough that he kind of got pulled back from that. There was a chance he might have ended up there too. But uh, he's just super versatile – and uh, the kind of player you love on your team. Uh, I know Ed Lamb loves him as a special teams possibility uh, and would be happy to share him with special teams. As he's also the safeties coach, he gets to coach him twice, if that's the case. Uh, <laughs> but I, I just like Matt a lot. I, I just like what he brings. And, and good heritage, of course, with Spencer, and uh, I just like him as a player. 47 touchdowns as a junior at Connell High School, a Which smaller school in Washington, but still 2,500 yards <laughs> as a running back. Like Micah Simon, quarterback in high school in Texas, Kind of cool, like you said. These guys that are quarterbacks or running backs, they come in and you can put them in space, whether it's on defense, to make plays. I like those kind of guys. Yeah, and oftentimes, you know, some DBs get a bad rap. That's why they're playing defense if they don't make every catch. But uh, the guys who've been used to having the ball in their hands, you sometimes like switching over to that side because that's something that's usually pretty strong for them. Yeah, who's the next ball hawk for BYU football or the next prolate spheroid hawk? hawk. Yeah. <laughs> Or, 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 mm-hmm. I feel like you could insult somebody and confuse them at the same time by calling them that. I pulled my prolate spheroid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Greg, just out of sheer curiosity, what percentage of your shirts don't have any BYU insignia on them? In my closet right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The ones hanging on the hangers or in the shelves? Non-BYU logoed? Yeah. Ah. Uh, <laughs> gosh. <laughs> 20%? <laughs> might be, that might be a little high. Yeah, yeah. 20%. Wow. That wow. high. Wow. Okay. That, that is no logos? No logos. Okay, maybe 15%. I'm dropping it at, at <laughs> minute by minute. I, I got a lot of BYU stuff in the closet. I thank BYU for outfitting me <laughs> yeah. for the last quarter century of my life. You deserve yeah. that, yeah. man. Yeah. You put in so many years. Okay, not, not to, you know, last but not least is a regular thing we do with you. You're a dual citizen, but you remember the origin of your birth. It's I, called a cool thing about Canada. I am a naturalized U.S. citizen. Naturalized. Yeah, but my uh, mother is as well. Native Canadian, naturalized American. Still, well, welcome. Still, still love the homeland. If I were to go home, they'd still consider me a Canadian. Yeah. But I'm a naturalized American and proud to be so. Yeah. Uh, so my citizenship is here, but my upbringing is there. This yeah. is called a cool thing about Canada. Yeah. Cue the anthem. Go ahead, Greg. So, uh, who doesn't love mac and cheese, right? Nope. We all love, we all love mac and cheese. Right. Staple. Okay, uh, studies show that in the U.S., in any 12-week period, a third of the U.S. population will eat mac and cheese at some point. Okay? <laughs> and, that number goes to, and that number goes to 50% for kids. So in a 12-week period, one of every two kids will have mac and cheese at some point in this country. That's a pretty big deal. But in Canada, we eat 50% more mac and cheese per capita than the U.S., so much so that Canada is the world's leading per capita country in consumption of mac and cheese. (laughs) And we all know that when you're saying mac and cheese, we're talking craft mac and cheese, right? But in Canada, and you may have seen this because this has been a Twitter story for me in the last little while. Uh, In in Canada, craft macaroni and cheese goes by the name craft dinner. So I grew up on craft dinner is what it's called up there. It is the mac and cheese, but it's craft dinner. And we love craft dinner in Canada. In fact, some say that instead of poutine, that the true national meal of Canada is craft dinner. <laughs> there you go. We're gonna have an hour-long special. We with love you. our mac and just, cheese. All, just all cool things, things about Canada. All cool things. And, cool and again, thing cool Canada. is a relative term on this thing. But, uh, <laughs> it, it's a thing. It's a thing about Canada. I just gave you a thing. It's a. It's a thing that we hope is cool. Craft dinner sounds so much more. Oh, it's like formalized. So much more nouveau riche. So upper crust. I know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Stop using words we don't understand. <laughs> Come join us for a craft dinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> great, great stuff, man. Yeah. <laughs> Always nice to have you. Gave the man us many in things v, many to think of which about. Cool yeah, as well. yeah. yeah. Impress <laughs> your friends. All right. Uh, uh, players practice tomorrow, right? Yeah. It's exciting. One of the guys practicing is going to be Tanner Mangum. And he's coming up next. Yes, he uh, Nicely done. Yeah. Nicely yes, done. Okay, yeah. now I really need to bring it for your first show. <laughs> Holy cow. The cool thing about Clinton, Utah, maybe? I don't know. No. Probably doesn't, not do that. doesn't resonate like no, Canada. Not the same ring. That's doesn't right. resonate.